Good afternoon. My name is Shannon Billings and I am moderating our panel today. I was chosen because I am the Chief Financial Officer at ACYPL and I was responsible for navigating our application for a Paycheck Protection Program loan. Um, I've also spent a great deal of time on webinars learning about the various aspects of the federal response to COVID-19 and uh, as it relates to nonprofits and our employees. Um, we are very grateful that our panel today includes three members of the ACYPL community who have been guiding and advising their clients on the various federal economic relief efforts designed to help American businesses, workers, parents, and the unemployed through this unprecedented and challenging time. Amal Nayak is a principal in the public policy practice at Squire Patton Boggs. Prior to joining the firm, Amol served as the chief resilience officer for the city of Atlanta, where he reported directly to Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. And before that, he held a number of senior government affairs and legal roles at Alphabet. Amol is an ACYPL alum who traveled to exchange, on exchanges to the lower Mekong, Argentina, and Timor-Leste. Jeff Shapiro is a partner at Peck Madigan Jones. Before joining the firm, he served as Washington representative for General Mills. Jeff has also served as an adjunct professor at the George Washington University and is a frequent lecturer on congressional operations and legislative process for Georgetown University's Washington Semester Program. He is currently participating in our exchange with Mexico. Jessica Woolley is a policy advisor at DLA Piper's Federal Law and Policy Practice. Prior to joining DLA, she spent several years working in the U.S. House of Representatives for members of the Blue Dog Coalition and has worked on several political campaigns. Jess is also an ACYP alum who traveled to India. So thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, to frame our conversation, I just wanted to kind of give you a sense of where we're going to take this, this hour. Um, as you all may be aware, Congress has passed several pieces of legislation to address the various aspects of the pandemic, with several more in the pipeline, that could fuel hours of conversation. But with only one hour today, we plan to focus our discussion on the status of the federal economic recovery efforts, the effectiveness and political implications of these efforts, and if and how politics will factor into future federal action. So let's begin with a quick primer on how the federal government has responded to date. We'll define some of the terms um, and the acronyms that we we'll use during our discussion and where things stand for today. So for that, let me turn it over to Jeff. Great. Thanks, Shannon. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I thought it might be useful just to recap what happened it seems forever ago um, and yet it was about four months ago which i guess in washington terms and in politics is about four lifetimes and nine thousand media cycles but um, i thought it'd be good to frame what happened beginning in march in response to the pandemic and so we can just go to the next slide um, you can review that congress has to date passed and the president has signed four major pieces of legislation. Um, we're fond here in Washington of referring to the upcoming package as phase four, and uh, we'll discuss that in a minute. But just to very briefly review, in order, it was really to cauterize the bleeding, so to speak, address the issue, and then rebuild. And with the looking ahead, many months ahead, around the election to a potential stimulus package, this was all done with the framing that this was a two week to 30 day pandemic issue crisis. Obviously that is not the case. But if we go back to March 6th, this was the first tranche. It was a major package, more than $8 billion um, that was largely spent for coronavirus response, um, public health funding, medical supplies, PPE, et cetera. This is when we saw just the uh, really crazy uh, supply chain issues begin to manifest themselves. Shortly thereafter, they moved on to like, let's help people who are immediately impacted by this. So this was a uh, relatively trimmed down package, 
um, but it provided food assistance, very limited unemployment grants, and uh, support for families who were viewed as the most heavily impacted by um, job loss. Just two weeks later, it became, or about a week and a half later, it became very obvious that this was a much larger scale problem. And that's when we saw the CARES Act, which is where the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program that Shannon referenced, was created. Um, this is a major response. It is uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, haven't done the um, pegged for inflation scale yet, but it's a $2 trillion package all in. Um, stimulus checks for nearly every household, uh, small business loans and grants came coming in the form of a souped up idle program, which was existing, and then the PPP, which is brand new. Um, additional loans out of treasury for the airline industry, as well as impacted defense contractors, um, and direction to the Fed to stand up a variety of lending facilities, uh, such as the Main Street Lending Facility, which they just got online. And in addition to that, a tremendous chunk of change directly to states and directly to hospitals and other healthcare workers. Um, within a month, the PPP program was exhausted of money or just about to be exhausted of money. And so Congress came together and very quickly um, put together another half a trillion dollars of money to, to backstop the PPP program, extend the amount of time effectively that people had to spend it, and um, continue to provide some additional monies for testings and hospitals. All of these packages that passed, passed um, unanimously, um, somewhat because they had to, because Congress wasn't physically meeting. But it, it, we have never seen before this scale of response, both in dollars and also four different bills passing over a period of time of a month and a half, uh, while obviously the politics underlying it were changing. Earlier, uh, this rather last month, later last month uh, in June, they did another PPP tweak um, again, that was a unanimous issue. As we look ahead, though, and I know we're going to talk about it in a little bit, phase four, another big response that deals with unemployment insurance, et cetera, is not setting up to be the same type of um, this is a response that we absolutely need to have something on a tremendous scale for. Uh, this is not going to be something that has broad bipartisan support for a number of buckets. It's just going to be a totally different process altogether than the way the first four packages developed. And I think that's a really good um, segue, Jeff. I think that if anyone who's familiar with the way Washington works can attest to the fact that the speed with which the Congress acted was remarkable. Mm -hmm. Jess, why don't you comment a little bit about the political atmosphere that kind of made that possible? Absolutely. Thank you, Shannon. Um, you know, I think that Jeff touched on a few issues, particularly the bipartisanship that allowed such an enormous, you know, $2 trillion to be spent unpaid for, which I think is a, a very, very important point to happen with essentially the CARES Act was negotiated and passed within a matter of days. You had Secretary Mnuchin and Leader Pelosi or Speaker Pelosi really directly negotiating. Um, there was quick attempts in the Senate that failed and then turned back to sort of the negotiators to come up with something that, as Jeff said, was passed unanimously uh, in both chambers of uh, necessity. Uh, but I think just by way of historical example, if you look back at the economic crisis um, in 2008, you know, right before the election, we passed the TARP bill to quickly shore up um, the banks and the financial markets. President Obama took office in January, and it wasn't until the middle of February that we really passed um, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And even then, which was far, far small, smaller than this package, it was about $800 billion, um, not a single Republican in the House voted for that bill. And now you look just, you know, you know a few years later, a decade later, and we had overwhelming bipartisan support. I think the, the uncertainty of it all, the, the scariness, because it wasn't systemic, there was a need to sort of throw everything at the wall, which is what you saw with the CARES Act. You know, all of these different pots of money were different ways to address 
you know, that what was coming as, as one big problem. So I think the, um, it says a lot. I, I'm amazed at the bipartisanship. I'm amazed at some of the leadership, you know, with um, Senator Rubio really working on the PPP side of things, um, with Democrats really holding together on unemployment insurance and the additional $600. It was such a, a quick, quick and an inspiring moment, I will say, for Congress. Um, like, you know, Jeff said, I will agree. I think that the time has sort of come where that bipartisanship is ending. And now the real political reality is going to start to play into what's next. Um, I think the cost is, is one factor that history is going to look back at and and judge whether we wisely, you know, eventually spent what is close to now six trillion dollars unpaid for. Um, and what are the political consequences? A lot of people would say that the um, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act in 2009, that that early winter, really spurred the Tea Party's growth. So will this moment in history? for a movement similar to that, or will it be different because all parties had a vested interest in this? There was no dissent, you know, we, we were able to do it by unanimous consent and voice vote in the House. So I think uh, the jury's still out, we're still kind of reevaluating. And now that we're less in a crisis moment, this next bill I think is going to, to look really, really different. So we'll, we'll have to see what that history judges us on that. Yeah, that's, uh, we, we, should, we will get to talk about that a bit at the, at the end of the discussion. Um, I do think um, we, we can acknowledge there were clear benefits and challenges to the rapid response. Um, and um, Amal, I wonder if you could address some of that. And one of our audiences specifically asked a sort of a related question to that, which is, um, how do you respond to the criticism that some of the stimulus funds ended up going to companies that did not need it, or even those who have been critical of excess federal spending? Well, thank you, Shannon, and thank you to ACYPL. Um, just briefly, uh, you know, really, I know we're all huge fans of the organization, but at a time like this, I think this bipartisanship um, is really needed, and, and thank you for everything you all do. You're really glad to be here today. Um, as, as far as um, you know, what we have seen play out. I think Jeff and Jess did a, a wonderful job sort of explaining the lay of the land. I mean, first of all, it's really worth repeating again, just the staggering amounts of money and the staggering speed upon which this was all done. And so it's a it's an overused phrase, but it's really true where you're sort of building the plane as you fly it. I mean, nothing could be further from the truth here. I think we should all have some level of sympathy for the folks in government who, um, you know, we're trying their absolute best to, to get this stuff done while also dealing with life just like the rest of us with, you know, healthcare concerns and kids and all the rest. And so if you look at it in that context, really there's a lot of public service that did a pretty remarkable job in getting things up quickly. Um, but certainly with that level of speed, there were enormous challenges. Um, and, and one of those challenges I think ultimately became who received some of these funds. Um, and it's interesting because it just shows the underlying politics of the day, which is that there, there, you know, while there has been some fraud, and I think there will be a, um, a significant amount of oversight in coming days to look into people who really should not have taken it from a legal standpoint. There's this other consideration of, you know, should people have taken it for an optics or better good standpoint, which is why there were, you know, professional sports organizations, major universities that very quickly after having received funds early on gave it back. Um, I think realizing they didn't want that scrutiny. And when we, when we were advising clients, we did sort of flag that issue. And then there were certainly folks that are, you know, not sympathetic recipients um, that have received the money now. And, and by all accounts, they seem to have met all the legal requirements. But I think the anger just, again, goes to show um, what's going on in the country, right? And, and there's folks that are really struggling, and there's a sense that the, the folks at the top are getting even more wealthy. I know we'll talk about some of this later, but if there was ever any doubt that the stock market and the economy are not really the same thing, um, this situation that we're currently in 
probably demonstrates that, where the markets, um, to the credit of the Federal Reserve, have been pretty stable and, and have been doing pretty well. And, and can't say that for a lot of working families in America. So um, I would say that, you know, I'm sympathetic to, uh, for as far as the audience questions, some of the, the criticisms as to who received it. Uh, I would say I'm also sympathetic to the recipients because many of them, it seems like, had every right to take it from a legal perspective. And let's, let's talk about a little bit about what the challenges of government bureaucracy, you know, dealing with some of the rapid, like the SBA and so forth, were, were they, do you think they were equipped? Do you, how do you, how do you think they dealt under the pressure of this timing? You know, my, it seems as if certainly people were doing the best that they could, but it's clear that some of the agencies were just completely overwhelmed. Um, and that's not altogether surprising when, you know, we just, I'm sure all of us had a situation, we're talking to clients who are just desperate, right? You, you go from, you know, your revenue falls to zero overnight, you're trying to keep people employed. It's just a really, really difficult situation. And then I think there's probably a number of unintended consequences, such as for PPP, the, the unbanked folks, you know, if you don't have a good relationship with the, the banks that administer PPP, you didn't get it. And so I'm sure no one intended that to happen and they needed someone to disperse the funds. But the, um, again, sad reality, just as like we're seeing with COVID-19 and with some of the economic impacts is that it seems like the folks at the top continue to do better and, and everyone else continues to do a little worse. And um, there's no doubt that's gonna have uh, short and long-term political ramifications. But I do think, just to add on to that, the utilization of the SBA, which um, to those of us who've been in Washington a while and have dealt with the SBA, we all kind of went, hmm? I mean, it's, you know, multiples of, of times the amount of money that the, the SBA lends annually went out in a period of 30 days. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason for that is because SBA was really the only federal agency with a broad network outside of maybe the farm credit administration, uh, but with a broad network of banks. And it, it was just determined that this is by far and away the easiest way to get the money out. Um, the, the juxtaposition to that would be the lending facilities that the Fed has stood up they just take a much longer time because that is not the function of the Fed. It's not really the function of really any government entity to, to be the bank. Um, and so just as Treasury uh, previously, certainly under the Bush administration, and again under the Obama administration, struggled to get checks out um, to everyone, and we saw this again with, with the Trump administration trying to get checks out to people, you know, SBA had trouble getting money out, but, but they had the most established rules within the 7A program, which is through which the PPP runs, which also had its limitations, right? PPP, the 7A doesn't allow any financial services company to participate in SBA lending, which meant no financial services company could receive a PPP loan. Um, so there, there are obviously limitations to it, but at the time, and I even think in retrospect, I'm not sure if there was another entity that could have gotten out that much money um, even though it wasn't as efficient as we all would have liked it to be, but in that short a time to that many people. I think, Shannon, I'll, I'll make one closing note on this, and I think you probably experienced this in application. The rules weren't even public or published as you were applying for this money. So taking out, you know, let's assume you, you got $500,000, you may not have known if that was going to be a loan, if that was going to be a grant, how to, how to keep track of the accounting records. I mean, there's a lot of detail in that. So, you know, I'm all alluded to that about, you know, building the plane as you fly it, but there are real implications for small businesses who knew nothing about, you know, the SBA, knew nothing about how to apply for this. And then frankly, just took the money in and didn't know and still, you know, are learning how to, you know, make sure you check all the boxes, be as transparent as possible, keep track of all your records, certify that you've kept employees on the payroll, all of those, those nuances sort of happened in tranches after that money even went out. So um, it's been a learning curve, quite literally, for everyone in the country, from, from the businesses to the government. Yeah, that's an excellent point. The FAQs for these loans were being updated almost daily, um, so it was very hard 
to continually sort of revise your expectations about what that was going to mean for your organization or your business. Um, let's turn a little bit to the effectiveness of the response. Uh, I think I, I would like all of you to talk about this a little bit, but Kamal, why don't you lead off with what do you think if the anticipated outcomes of this legislation have, have the have the have the policies realized what what we had, what people had hoped? Well, I mean, I would think you would say yes, no, and then probably the biggest bucket is TBD, really, given the scope and, and uncertainty that we still face. I think um, on the yes and positive side of things, it's pretty clear that PPP did keep the unemployment numbers um, somewhat under control. Um, you know, obviously, there was a lot of folks that lost jobs, but PPP did allow businesses to keep some some, a lot of people uh, employed that may have otherwise been unemployed. So I think, especially in that regard, it was a success. I think the what the Federal Reserve did um, very early uh, clearly stabilized the markets. I mean, let's not forget that at the beginning of this, or you know, in one or two days, the market had lost like 20% or so of its value. And so um, the Federal Reserve stepping up and and doing something about that, I think, at least for um, for the markets was was spectacular. In the short term, the the no part and the TBD part, in my opinion, would be, you know, what are the long term ramifications of this sort of injection of capital? Um, you know, what what sort of debt is, you know, our US citizens collectively buying here? And, you know, who is benefiting ultimately from this as, as probably a lot of probably everyone on this listing of this has some kind of investment in the stock market, but most citizens don't, right? Most folks in the country don't. And so, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm worried about those inequity problems, but um, again, TBD really long-term as to, to how this will, will all play it out. I think we'll be looking back at this for years and years to come and analyzing really how effective this was. And also not to mention, I know this is a, a subject for I think a later ACYPL discussion, but the state and local government entities around the country are really uh, struggling. There's huge budget deficits and um, there's so many implications for, for that from personal services that are provided to the municipal bond markets and all the rest. And so it's uh, it's pretty clear that, that there's a lot more that is going to need to have to happen. Yeah, I think the uh agree with all of that, particularly the TBD <laughs> um, component. Um, you know, I think the unemployment insurance program is, uh, I say this as a Republican, and I know a lot of Republicans had some issues with it, but when you have governments at all levels telling businesses they can't be in business, it is the government's responsibility to make sure that those people have, have assistance. And um, the debate can be over how long and how much but the fact that they established a pandemic unemployment insurance program, that they funded it at $600 a week, um, that's in addition to underlying unemployment. Um, you know, if I were a Democrat, that's a very good policy success. It's a de facto $15 an hour wage, um, which is a huge part of the negotiation in the upcoming phase four. But, you know, that alone has helped. We've seen some retail sales statistics recently come out. Um, I do think the bleeding would have been far worse. Um, if but for the UI and the PPP. Um, but a few misses, frankly, were on the tax side. And we should be fortunate that those were misses because a lot of the assumptions that went into what they did in CARES assumed that the, the economic hardship would be even worse. The example I would use would be the employee retention tax credit, um, as well as the Main Street lending facility. The employee retention tax credit basically a lot, it allows employers um, to take cash against the uh, payroll taxes of employees provided they keep the employees on the payroll. The, the caveat was that that business in order to be eligible had to have a 50% loss quarter over quarter in revenue. And they assumed most businesses would have that. And the reality is very few in fact did. Um, and of those who did, most just went out of business. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately. Um, so it, it was an under, it, it remains an underutilized tax credit that they're trying to fix for the future. And the other would be the Main Street Lending Facility, which was set up in order to be almost a pairing with the PPP for larger businesses, those that didn't qualify for the PPP. But because it took the Fed so long to stand it up, and in the meantime, because of the PPP, most banks now have a tremendous amount of cash. It came to the business owner, but most business owners deposited that money. 
So lending syndicates are uh, much more favorable on the private market for most businesses right now than the Main Street lending facility is um, now that it's stood up. In fact, I'm not, I believe zero people have actually utilized the Main Street lending facility to date. So there are definitely some misses um, that, you know, they might try to fix in upcoming uh, items, but I agree, I'm all, I, I think we won't know for a couple of years really what worked and what didn't. Jess, do you have additional thoughts? In full agreement, and I think a lot of what both Amol and Jeff said will color sort of our next steps as Congress comes back in the next week to 10 days and negotiates, you know, another stimulus, an extension potentially of unemployment insurance, dealing with liability. They're going to want to have learned a lesson over four months that will probably take years to learn. So I think even in next steps, the knowledge we have is going to be anecdotal at best um, in terms of, of what to do and how effective it was. I think, you know, Jeff's point about unemployment is probably unemployment insurance is, is very, very valid. I think we'll see Democrats fight really, really hard for that. Um, and, and the idea of some stability in, in creating, you know, um, opportunities that were just missed on the tax side of things. Um, I'm not particularly optimistic about what next steps will look like, but um, I, I have to give Congress a lot of credit. And coming from Washington, you know, that isn't something I say a lot, but they really did do a lot quickly. And so I think, um, well, this is a, a history moment. And, and we're still learning, by the way, from the 2008 economic crisis from 9-11. I mean, you know, 20 years after 9-11, we are still tweaking a lot of, more than tweaking, a lot of our sort of oversight laws. And, and as a result of the, you know, TARP money in 2008, we are still 10 years later trying to figure out, you know, lessons from that. So I think trying to learn in four months presents them potentially another $2 trillion putting a lot at the feet of Congress. So I certainly am in admiration to some of it. I think that's a really good point, Jess, about 9-11 as a reference point. You know, a year after 9-11, Congress set up the Terrorism Risk Insurance Program, or TRIA, as we all know it. Um, it's fortunately never been tapped into, but it took a year after 9-11 to do it. And I mean, really within two weeks of coronavirus hitting the United States, People were calling for business interruption insurance or pandemic insurance. And, you know, it, we need to take a lesson from 9-11 and it, let's, let's see who's impacted. Let's, it, should it be a premium support program? Should it be a government backstop program? It takes time to really get these things right. And we're just now starting to see members of Congress and senators use TRIA as a, as a reference point. Like that took a year we should take our time in making sure we get something like this right if we choose to do it. Great, can we share the next slide, Christina? So as Jeff noted in his introduction that when all this began, there seemed to be an expectation that American life would return to normal by summertime. It's now July 16th and uh, we all know that is not the case as we see it here in our homes and uh, on Zoom calls. And Congress and the uh, administration are faced with an ongoing economic crisis and they are approximately something like 35 to 40 legislative days remaining in the year, as you can see from this calendar. Um, if, uh, if we can take our conversation now to where it was logically heading, which is to kind of what's next. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Christina. Um, Jeff, why don't you walk us through this, uh, this Venn diagram sure. uh, that includes the possible areas of agreement for additional legislation. And then, you know, Jess, Jess and Amol, please um, share your thoughts on the likelihood of any agreement um, based on your expertise in various areas of policy. Sure. Um, this is uh, two caveats. One, this is a, uh, a, a political scientist take at a Venn diagram. Um, so it's a little crude, um, but also the, we put the White House at the top just because it's also the most um, uh, 
it, it's the mo it's the known unknown and the greatest unknown is where they will land at any given time um and that's born from uh three and a half years of just witnessing it and um you know this is roughly the list of asks and expectations i would point out really two big things one under the house democrats uh, list would be um, extended expansion of the unemployment insurance program, which we just discussed. And two would be within the White House and Senate Republican bubble, the liability protections. I won't spend much time on, on anything else. Um, the liability protections would, would be um, basically an expedited process to deal with claims. And it would be retroactive to when the national emergency was first um, uh, uh, issued by the president earlier this year. And um, the, we're bad at prognosticating in Washington. Um, I think the last election cycle proved that, but um, the action forcing date for unemployment insurance is the end of July. It runs out, it expires. And so if Congress does nothing by uh, the last week of July, that program will go away and Democrats are heavily motivated to give Republicans something so that that program can continue um, if I were a betting man, I'd uh, say that whatever we get at the end of the month, sharing some of Jess's um, pessimism, I think you said not optimism. So I'll, I'll say the, I'll just say the negative word of it is uh, I bet it's going to be a short term kick until September 30th. Congress is really good at that. September 30th is the end of the fiscal year. It's the end of a mortgage forbearance program that was set up in the CARES Act. It is the end of the surface transportation bill. It is the end of the water resources development <laughs> act. Um, so there are a lot of motivations, uh, obviously, to get things done before the election at that point. Um, and I would just note one other thing, and then I'll be quiet. From a House Democrats perspective, their offering was the HEROES Act, um, which is a very substantive um, negotiating platform. Uh, it's uh, they've got a unanimous support from their caucus. And for Republicans, we will see what their ask is next week. Mitch McConnell is supposed to unveil the Republican plan. I would say that a lot of Republicans in the Senate don't feel that they need to act and spend more money. And so uh, query whether or not he'll actually put a vote on that bill um, and test his conference's support. Uh, obviously, there's some political risk to that as he negotiates a package with Nancy Pelosi. I just chime in for 10 seconds on something that Jeff said that I think is really, really uh, valuable. Congress creates a lot of false deadlines. I think, you know, we always say the end of the fiscal year, you know, the fiscal cliff, and then we do, you know, 10 day extensions or 24 hour extensions. Unemployment ending at the end of July is actually a real deadline. I think that that impacts people's pocketbooks. Um, in a pretty impactful way as we're seeing. And so while I am not optimistic, maybe pessimistic, I actually think there is, like you said, maybe a real deadline here to do something, regardless of you know if it's short term, if it's long term, what it looks like. I think that we're now believing that that may in fact be a, you know, an actual deadline within a few days of that. Obviously we can do things retroactively. We do do things retroactively actively um but this you know feels slightly different to me so i would just add that first of all and diagram is is really good um and, and su succinct as to sort of the state of play at the moment um one thing that is very heartening to me to see here is this consensus on rural broadband in particular um, and i would add to that really underserved areas and urban areas probably as well i mean this is a, a time when Broadband is an essential element of life, right? I mean, uh, you're talking about virtual schools, you're talking about telehealth. If you're not on the internet in a real way, you're completely out of society. Um, I'm not sure that wasn't true before, uh, but this crisis has made it crystal clear that that is now the case. And so hopefully there is some consensus there, um, whether it's in the short or medium term, uh, because there's a real dire need. Um, you know, being from rural North Carolina originally, I keep thinking about, you know, what folks that are without the internet are really gonna do as far as, you know, school kids. And so I saw that one of the 
um, solutions was to give people that don't have internet, um, kids don't have internet at home, sort of like a packet of instruction. So while everyone else is literally on the internet, these other kids that are from more challenging situations are going to have to be left or alone with a, with a packet of paper. And so that's obviously not a sustainable long-term solution for anyone. Um, and I'd also say infrastructure um, is another thing that I thought was really interesting on here. Um, it does seem like that at various points there was some uh, agreement between the White House and House Democrats on infrastructure and the need to do something. Uh, Vice President Biden made an infrastructure announcement on Tuesday. President Trump made one yesterday. Um, and so, you know, if you are looking for sort of rays of hope on some long-term issues that, that nothing has happened on, perhaps there's something there. Um, I, I do share Jess and Jeff's sort of lack of optimism uh, generally on some of those things, but um, we can be hopeful. Well, one of our audience about how the federal government might address the dramatic budget shortfalls um, that Amol, you referenced earlier about the state and local governments are facing and that's in the sort of White House Democrats part of the spend diagram. What do you think the likelihood of, of support either for, for very specific things like, you know, schools so that schools can reopen or, or just generally? Well, uh, at, really at some point there's going to be no option but to act, right? I mean, you just, I, I think that there's consensus um, that letting state and local governments you know, go into the bankruptcy process would have any number of horrific ramifications. Um, there had been some, I think, minor talk about let states go bankrupt at, uh, at the beginning, but that seems to have faded. To me, that just, there's any number of reasons why that just wouldn't work. Um, and, and I will say that in the early days of this, this seemed like a more of a blue state, red state issue where some of the earliest impacts were in the blue states. That is obviously no longer the case. And so hopefully the, um, the desire to help state and local governments now will be more bipartisan because it is a nationwide issue. Uh, but I'd be interested in what uh, Jess and Jeff have to say in that regard. Well, I, yesterday was uh, obviously a big day for most states on July 15th, new tax filing day. And, you know, we'll see how receipts are. Um, and I, I think the reason why McConnell is waiting until next week and maybe even beyond to release his package is because whatever, it basically have three buckets in it, a tax component, probably something on unemployment slash return to work, and then state and local. And how much of that state and local is dedicated towards getting kids and teachers back in schools and, and child care providers back in child care centers so that people can return to work versus how much money is going to the you know the public sector in states and in and in municipalities it will largely be dictated by the revenue that did or did not come in from yesterday and um, the base assumption is that states will not get anywhere near what they had hoped for certainly given the extra amount of dollars that they had to set aside to deal with coronavirus um, and so uh, I I don't know if it's as persuasive as a talking point among Republicans, but I know we'll get into Jess's map here in a little bit, but more and more Republicans throughout the country are finding themselves in a very politically precarious spot. Um, so uh, Mitch McConnell cares about nothing more than remaining the Senate majority leader. So he will likely respond in kind in order to try to ensure that that remains the case. Just agreement, obviously. The one thing that I think, you know, might not be obvious on this is the urgency of state and local relief might not be up there as much as, say, the unemployment insurance and maybe the, the liability. So it could be one of those things that could be punted until after the election, um, depending on the politics. Again, we'll have to see the numbers in the next week. Um, the way state budget works, it, it's different in 50 different states. So those deadlines are, are not as real in some places, say, um, that don't operate on the same fiscal calendar. So we'll see.
said, well, well, why don't we So Shannon, you're, the next, you're frozen the next for me. And, um, and oh, go ahead now. To the pure politics. Of okay, great. Um, so I, I'd love to hear what uh, you all think about the politics of uh, the crisis impacting elections and what you think the elections impact will have on the politics of further government efforts. So I'll take a quick cut at this and then definitely defer to Amal and Jeff. This is the map, the electoral map of where we're at, um, you know, in November in terms of elections and what's in play. I think, you know, you would have said this in January. It was going to be a volatile year anyway. We were looking at sort of um, a, a very unpredictable, unpredictable presidential election. We were looking at um, states that you wouldn't typically put in a, in a toss-up category. Um, so it's only become more and more volatile since then. I am using Charlie Cook uh, here as a, a sort of bearer um, in terms of toss-up races. We now have Arizona, Colorado, Maine, Montana, and North Carolina. Of those, I think we probably expected um, Colorado and Maine to be competitive regardless. Um, but now we're looking at places like North Carolina, and some would even stretch this to say maybe um, Georgia, one of the two seats up in Georgia. So the uh, the map looks pretty opportunistic for Democrats. I think in all of these individual races, polls have been really, really promising for challengers. Um, and, and in some places, because they have great um, candidates, you know, having a sitting governor running in Montana is good news for Democrats, but it also really sort of illustrates this question of COVID response to the political situation, because in Montana, Governor Bullock is, is making the calls on reopening the government, as well as running for governor. You know, in, in places like Colorado and Maine, you have two sitting senators who really have to decide you know, are they going to support another $2 trillion of unpaid for spending you know, less than 90 days out from an election, potentially. So I think um, we could probably argue over all of these races, but I think it's weighing very, very heavily on these individual senators' minds. But I think, you know, Jeff can maybe talk about how much it's weighing on Senator McConnell's mind. If he <laughs> has, you know, five or six really vulnerable Republicans up, and, you know, do you give them a pass? Do you cut them in on the negotiations. There, there's a lot of politics at play here. Um, as a Democrat, I look at this map and I'm excited, uh, but I also say Democrats never miss a chance to miss a chance. Um, <laughs> and so Democrats have to be really careful um, in how they're approaching the election as well, you know, not to overstep. Like I said earlier, the Tea Party was really created out of that economic crisis of 2008 and 2009. And so I think Democrats have to be really careful not to run to the left um, and spend, you know, trillions of dollars unpaid for, um, because I don't think that's where the electorate is. I think the electorate wants us to act. I think they want something, but I'm not sure they want, you know, three trillion dollars of, of pork. I can't believe I'm bringing that word back, but you know, of pork spending. So um, it's it's dynamic, and what I will say is, it is hard to predict at this point because, you know, had you asked in February, you would have gotten one answer, in early March, you would have gotten one answer. Then we had Black Lives Matter, which is a totally different, unrelated matter. And so, for anyone making predictions, be careful because. Um, I'm not fearing an October surprise. I'm fearing an August, September, October, and November surprise, you know, with this quickly as the sand's shifting. So, um, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, well, I think just raises a great points, and um, I would probably put a few more states up there on the, uh, the toss-up list as well. But um, I think there are a number of factors that are influencing this map. Um, some have been building for a while and some are, are more acute. Um, obviously the, the, the social justice um, 
issues that have rightfully been raised and are or sort of addressed legislatively and are not now being addressed legislatively, um, that, that is absolutely having an impact in the electorate. Um, in addition to that, we're now going on three and a half years of Trump. That has an impact on the electorate and was already having an impact on the electorate. And then you have coronavirus and the economic impact of that. And related directly to coronavirus is we're going to have most of these states do mail-in only, um, which as, you know, for anyone on the line who's run a race or bit, had their name on the ballot for a race, that changes a dynamic of a race. Um, it is a totally different way of spending money. It's a totally different way of activating your grassroots. It's a totally different way of reaching voters and repeatedly reaching voters and being organized and being in touch with the Secretary of State or the local election counting commissioner, depending on how your state is structured and what data the state provides about who's received a ballot and if you can contact them if they haven't sent it in. And, and the, you know, if you know the rules and you're organized enough to adopt to, adapt to them, you're gonna be in a really, really good position. Some of these states already have mail-in, like Arizona and Colorado, and um, I believe Washington State is 100% now, but more will. And Arizona's had mail-in for the majority of the state for a long time. And it still takes weeks to figure out who wins a race there. So um, you can see, uh, for those of us who had to suffer through 2000, that being nothing compared to what we're about to see if some of these states are close and they're all mail-in and we're waiting for overseas ballots or there's issues about absentee ballots and who voted, who didn't. Um, it could get really, really bad really, really quickly and prolong many of these races, in particular, the one at the top of the ticket. I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, the volatility here is something worth underscoring. I think, um, you know, just think of yesterday, right? Um, Vice President Biden's Twitter account was hacked and it was some, you know, scam to get some, some cash, but just imagine that it had it been used for something else. So the amount of things that could happen between now and November are unprecedented. But I also agree with Jeff in that I, I think um, there's probably a lot more toss up states. I, I would, as a Democrat, I would say, and also an Atlanta Falcons fan, it feels like we're up 28 to three, but we also know the Falcons did not win that, <laughs> that Super Bowl. Um, you know, the, the amount of money that the challengers in South Carolina and Kentucky have raised in particular is something I don't think anyone could have seen. 200,000 more Democrats voted in the uh, Democratic primary in Georgia uh, three weeks ago than Republicans, which is uh, pretty astounding. First time it's happened in a decade. Um, you know, we have we have two open Senate races in Georgia by quirk of Senator Isaacson retiring. And again, the volatility in the, the race um, that Senator Leffler is in, which is doesn't have a traditional primary, it's a jungle primary, shows you everything you need to know. There were early polls, this has now changed a bit, but there were early polls in which neither the DSCC or RSCC candidate was it was in the top two to go to the runoff getting 50%. Uh, Representative Collins, who is running to the right, and um, um, Joe Lieberman's son's actually running as a Democrat to the left. And so we'll see how all that shakes out. There's almost 100% chance that that Georgia race, no one gets 50% and it's not decided until December. So you could easily foresee that potentially even being, you know, determinative of who controls the Senate. And I agree with Jeff as far that the voting issues are going to be enormous, right? Because it's not what the polls say, it's who actually cast the ballot, ballot on election day. And um, I think the, the elections that we have seen that have been conducted since the start of this are, should be problematic to, to every American. Um, there's been some really, really serious challenges. I think, again, vote by mail also completely changes who votes, so it's, it's hard to predict. So mm -hmm. um, just like my previous punning of an answer, I'd say TBD, but, um, you know, Right now, if you're a Democrat, this looks better than anyone could have thought from a political perspective, I think, in February. And, and Jeff, you talked about the HEROES Act. Doesn't the HEROES Act have some um, electoral support and maybe some USPS support? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, considerable on a cash in the HEROES Act to go to states to upgrade their um, 
their election security, but also their election systems and software. You know, most, most localities, as everyone on this call knows, how you vote is determined at the really local level, really, really local level. You can vote on one piece of equipment in one county and vote and move counties and vote on a completely different equipment with different rules about the ballot structure in the next county. So um, the variations in um, ballot devices and in how ballots are structured, I think if we all look back on the, the Florida ballot and how it was, for those of us who remember that in the Rick Scott Senate race, um, that ballot was just structured in a very, very weird way but that was determined at the local level. And so how you achieve some sort of, uh, I don't want to say national standard, but certainly national conformity on ballots when you're going to have dozens and dozens of ballot question of referenda questions in some states or some counties or some cities, you're also going to have to reconcile in certain states, people under the age of 18 can vote in local elections um, and others you can't. And then, you know, if it's all mail, uh, federal law says you have to mail uh, a ballot without a stamp on it. Not everybody knows that, including uh, local election commissioners, so they might not count it. Um, the point of the funding in Heroes was to address some of the issues that I'm raising um, in particular, upgrading the systems and software of in these localities. I, there have been a number of bills that have already passed and enacted that already have funded some of these efforts. The reality, unfortunately, is just some of the acquisition rules at the local level. They just don't allow for the amount of time needed um, to be up and running this November. Uh, you know, for public comment periods, and then you have to do cybersecurity testing. And in some cases, you have to write brand new software. And it's, it's really, really complicated stuff. Um, I compare like the voting infrastructure to your credit card and how it works. Um, most people don't even think about it. They just dip their card and they buy something. But behind it is, you know, millions of things that are happening <laughs> that you don't even think about. And that's kind of how voting is right now. And, and so it's going to take billions and billions of dollars and a lot of time to actually get our voting systems up to the point where we could have a safe, secure, and quick result on a mail-in basis for national elections. So we have time for sort of one more topic, and I just wanted to ask if you thought there was a difference between what might happen in a lame duck session and a post election section session uh, based on what happens in activity based on a, a leader McConnell losing his his job I'll, I'll give it a quick crack <laughs> but, but um, I, in in that scenario I'm gonna just leave aside the fact that we might have a president who's unwilling to leave office I, I actually don't think that that's a, a cynical quip I think it's a very real possibility, um, depending on where the electoral votes are. Um, the, the, the party that is losing power is the most motivated to cut a deal. Uh, there is a two week gap roughly between when a new Congress takes office and when a, pres a new president is signed in. Um, so if that scenario were to happen, Mitch McConnell would be in the minority for two weeks um, under the last two weeks of a President Trump, it's conceivable that you would just want things to sort of be shut down on a temporary basis if you can't cut a deal. Um, my sense, McConnell's such an institutionalist. Um, he takes the perspective of that he's bought, whoever's president is just renting, that I think he'd come to some sort of a deal with Schumer on nominees in, addition, in, in exchange for some punting into a new year with the understanding that you know the filibuster rules are going to change um you're going to potentially have all three run by the same party and you know you're going to have uh wide scale changes that occur and so i do think in that case he'll be motivated to get a deal and get out of town and get some more noms through he will not be motivated to do any more money for coronavirus efforts because the assumption among republicans and frankly it's a conversation they're already having is if we're going to lose anyway they're going to they're going to spend so much more money come January, February, and March in a stimulus effort. Why would we spend any money now? 
And it's a real conversation that they're having now that will certainly be the case in a lame duck if it turns out that Republicans lost the majority in the presidency. I'd just like to take a moment to just pause and reflect on the fact that we all of us are sort of calmly nodding at the fact that there's a real possibility that the president may not leave office if he loses, right? Mm -hmm. And just, I mean, just to really think about that in the historical context of the United States um, and to think of, and I hope we all really take to heart how fragile um, our democracy really is. Um, Jessica and I had the opportunity to go to Timor Leste, Day, which is the world's newest democracy. And, um, you know, in a lot of ways, we're not very different it, it, when, when you're just kind of matter of factly all just sort of acknowledging that that is the case. And so I hope for the good of all of us that people come out of this thinking that it was a free and fair election. Um, you know, we, we really need that. Um, for, uh, from a country standpoint. We don't need people to think that something was stolen or illegitimate. Um, I think for, for our healing, whatever, whoever wins in 2021, for us to all move forward, I think people need to feel like uh, there was a legitimate process. And, and I am a little concerned about that given all the intricacies that we've been talking about. Well said. Jess, do you have any final remarks on the lame duck or anything else? No, sure. I absolutely agree <laughs> with, with the statements that were made. Um, and, and one of my big concerns too, maybe speaking to what we did on COVID is that I really want people to know what their government does for them. And I really want them to um, appreciate that or you know be angry about that. And so I think that in, in times of crisis, like we're seeing right now, whether it's a pandemic or an economic crisis or a democratic crisis, all three at the exact moment in time, you know, uh, it's important to me that we have free and fair elections because I want people to, you know, be tied to their government. And I'm all said, you know, lessons from other democracies around the world. But um, I, I will just have to be optimistic that Congress can do something in the next 10 days slash four months um, to, to really move us on to the next battle because I think it is going to take us years to dig out of this economic pandemic and, you know, uh, democratic crisis. So um, I hope people are paying attention. Well, I want to thank everyone for sharing this um, this hour with us. Um, as uh, AC Wide Let, we measure the impacts of and the effectiveness of the, the work we're trying to accomplish now. And so we hope that you will um, take time to complete a short exit survey that uh, and you note some takeaways from the sessions. Uh, it will be emailed to you who participated um, live today and if you're watching this on uh, Facebook Live or on YouTube later, you um, they will find a link in the, on the in the description on the platform that you're choosing. Um, I uh, I'm very grateful to our three participants, our wonderful ACYPL alum and almost alum, um, and uh, just uh, I hope you'll tune into our next town hall um, next uh, Thursday, July 23rd. The focus will actually be. This economic recovery efforts with our ACYPL2 to, uh, to the next place. So thank you all very much for spending this hour with us. We're very grateful. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye all.